Hello. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Puya from Giant Swarm. I'm going to be the host for this session and the next one. This is the community track. And um, I would just ask you of one thing. We have a QA in the end. If you're leaving before that, leave very quietly because it's going to influence the recording. And the, like, I'd ask you just to, to respect the speakers. Um, with that said, um, please welcome Maria Dalla. And she's going to be talking about the release process at the example of the Kubernetes 1.14 release. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this talk. Thank you so much for stepping by. I know that you probably have better things to do in Barcelona at four, uh, so I really appreciate it. Um, good. Uh, just a couple of words about me. Uh, my name is Maria, and I am a software engineer and engineering manager for Pivotal in London. You can find me on Twitter, and I am Maria, very creatively, on the Kubernetes Slack. Um, I've been working in the open source uh, Kubernetes community for about a year now in a number of different areas, but mainly um, in SIG release. And I was part of the SIG, uh, sorry, part of the release team for the last two or three releases. Um, a little bit of an intro to the talk, and I guess like the motivation behind it. Uh, I personally find Kubernetes very interesting. Part of it is, of course, the software itself and the technology itself. Uh, it's a very, um, a very promising domain. There's tons of good stuff uh, coming out, both for people that want to uh, run their software on, on Kubernetes, but also for teams that are building platforms using it. So exciting, exciting stuff coming up in terms of the technology itself. I also find it very interesting from a perspective of, I guess, a human collaboration and community. And what I mean by community in that context is um, all the people from all over the world, from a whole different bunch of companies and time zones that in some way or another get together uh, and pretty consistently ship working software every three months without fail, and then go on to support it for another few months. Um, so I was quite curious to see what does that look like in practice? How do these people communicate? How do they collaborate? How do they start from idea and then reach consensus on, on what to build, how to build it, with what priority, and how to then um, go away and execute on that plan. Well, uh, it is an open source project, so that means that there is a whole lot of uh, publicly available data on that. Um, and so this is where I sort of like started the journey of putting this together. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to bring to you data points from the Kubernetes 1.14 release that ran earlier this year uh, between January 7th and um, March 25th. Um, and for that, we're going to look through aggregate data from GitHub, some summarized information from Slack, and also get a glimpse in other avenues that um, the Kubernetes contributors use for their collaboration and communication. Okay, so before we get started, I just have, uh, as a very wise person being recorded, I have a couple of disclaimers, or rather reminders, that, um, that I wanted to make before I go through the, the content ahead. The first one is that what's coming up is um, a whole lot of averages and summaries. Um, and I'm very conscious of the fact that any attempt to put numbers um, around humans and their behavior is a very inexact science and therefore will probably lead to um, imperfect results. So just please keep in mind that what's coming up is more intended as a fun conversation starter, uh, more so than a complete extensive piece of research. Disclaimer number two is that data is not reality. I'm about to talk about, about a bunch of information that's out there and I was personally curious about, so that was mainly the heuristic for for picking it, but keep in mind that there's, of course, a lot of stuff missing from it. Um, and one big example is that a lot of the collaboration that keeps the Kubernetes community ticking and going happens um, offline, face-to-face -face or in one-to-one -one conversations that are not recorded, uh, for example. And last but not least, um, I've done my best to be accurate, and I will not intentionally lie, but I'm not a data science expert. And so um, please keep in mind that what's coming up is approximations. I think they're fairly accurate, but they're still approximations. Okay, 
So, oversimplifying slightly, Kubernetes is largely made up of code, uh, pretty much entirely. <laughs> so, my first question was, how is that code shaped up? How does it change through, uh, through time? Uh, I figured that was a pretty central part of any Kubernetes release, so I wanted to dig into it a bit more. Um, so the Kubernetes code base is organized in an assortment of repos. They all live in, um, on GitHub, on, a, on the Kubernetes org. At the, the time of writing this, at this point in time, the Kubernetes org hosts 68 public repos, and they all, if I'm not mistaken, had some sort of activity during the 114 release. And by activity, I mean either issues created or PRs opened. Uh, now, don't be mistaken, not all Kubernetes-related activity happens uh, within the Kubernetes org. In fact, if you run a search for Kubernetes or Kates just on GitHub, you'll come back with, I think, tens of thousands of, of results. Uh, so it's quite a lively and rich ecosystem outside the core as well. Okay, so back into the Kubernetes core. There is a particularly interesting repo there. Uh, and that's the Kubernetes Kubernetes, or KK as the friends call it, where most development of core Kubernetes takes place. Now, over the course of 114, uh, over 1,000, 1,038 issues and 2,047 PRs to enhance Kubernetes were opened. And that's not counting anything that was opened before that was worked on during the release as well. So that's just things that were opened during those, the, those three months. Uh, of these, thousand and a bit issues, 400, almost half of them are still open today, and about 300 of the PRs that were opened during 114 are still being worked on today. And a total of 370 contributors participated in, in opening them. Okay, so let's look at the activity in a bit more detail. Uh, as we all know, a good contribution is measured by the lines of code, uh, end of sarcasm. So uh, I, I was actually quite curious to see just how, like what the size and the complexity of the contributions themselves were. Um, and there were close, of, close to 12 million lines of code added and about 6 million uh, removed, leaving KK about 5.5 million lines of code, heavier or richer uh, in lines of code. That's not 100% accurate because some of these PRs were closed and did not make it into master and into the release. Uh, but I still found it a pretty impressive number. The average PR across KK uh, was made up of about 15 commits. Um, and the most active area as well, the, the, the most active area in the repo is PKG, but more specifically, uh, there were three directories that were quite active, and that was kubectl, uh, the kubelet, and the scheduler. Okay, in terms of what these changes were in a bit more specifically, uh, it's kind of hard to know without going into the commit diffs in a bit more detail, but there were a total of 31,000 uh, total files changed. Some of these are duplicates, or it's about 6,000 unique ones. And of those, uh, 2,500 were Golang files, 300 were bash, 61 were markdown documentation usually, um, and a healthy 120 YAML files, which is quite, um, I guess, usual to see in a cloud software project. Um, an additional angle that I always find interesting to observe is the source code versus test code balance. Uh, and so in the just over 6,000 files that were touched with PRs during 114, uh, 2,200 of them had tests somewhere in the name, so I think they indicate um, that they are some sort of test at some level. Um, looking at Go files in specific, among the 2,500 Go files, 855 were tests. This is uh, just something that I tried to put together to, because I was quite curious to, to look at the intention behind the changes that would, like, the code is always interesting, but what is actually changing? And this was, um, this is some sort of the stuff that pops out in terms of the titles of the, the PRs and issues. So you'll see there's a lot of fix, there's a lot of test, there's a lot of, of course, add and remove. Uh, there's quite a bit of whip there at the bottom right, which is uh, all fun to see. And of course, I was also 
Um, I found it quite interesting to see cherry pick there. In fact, I think about 200 and something PRs, so just over 10% of the PRs that were opened during one theme were cherry picks to previous branches. Um, okay, who are these people though? I, I said that there were about, well, there were 370 contributors that opened issues and PRs during 114. 173 of them um, are organization members. That pretty much means that they've opened a number of PRs in the past and they, um, they've been around the block a little longer. Um, uh, whereas 197 of these people uh, were not members yet at the time. So a pretty interesting balance of uh, people that have got more experience contributing to open source Kubernetes and people that are a bit earlier on, on their journey. Okay, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself uh, and Kubernetes, like most real life software projects, uh, a pretty important chunk of the work is not code, but it's also design, debate, demos and much deliberation about, about the thing, about what we're building, about why we're building it, about how. Uh, and there's a couple of avenues that the community has available to itself when it comes to discussing these things. We touched on GitHub just now, and GitHub is actually a pretty strong one in this area as well. Um, across the over 3,000 issues and PRs that were opened um, during 114, excuse me, um, there were 18,000 plus comments um, that made up conversations underneath them. A lot of them came from bots, actually. They were not only humans. And bots, as you may have seen from interacting in GitHub repos, are very, very uh, participative, I guess. Like, they, they make a lot of comments. They, um, they take a lot of, they take care of a lot of things in the PRs. And it's pretty common to see activity rates of up to, like, 50 comments an hour from um, the KCI robot, for example, who is the face of the Kubernetes CI into GitHub. Uh, very often, what that made me remember is the, the cases that opening the PR is not the, the end of the game, so to speak. It's not the end of the conversation. Uh, but it's typically the point where consensus in principle starts becoming decisions in implementation, starts becoming um, thinking about edge cases, starts becoming agreement in details. Um, in fact, PRs that were opened during 114 have a mean um, duration or a mean lifetime, I guess, from, from open to end or, or merge of about 552 hours. So we're looking at north of collectively a million hours of work, quote unquote, although I, I know it's not hands on work all of this time uh, for the 114 timeline. Um, but as I said before, about 15% of these PRs remain open to this day, so that's definitely um, still growing as we speak. Um, of course, it's more than words that make up our conversations, and there were tons of non-word reactions to, to messages or like communication um, in non-word manner in KK PRs. Um, 834 of these uh, 1,200 plus reactions were thumbs up. Oopsie, double click. 15 were thumbs out, but very quickly. Uh, 44 were laughs. Um, 156 hoorays. 41 curious eyes. And 141 were hearts. Um, a whole lot of the conversation happens, as you may have guessed, on, on Slack. The Kubernetes Slack lives at kates.slack.io. Um, it hosts 267 public channels, um, and all but a few of them had activity during the 114 timeline. Um, the most active was SIG testing, uh, followed by SIG release. During the three months of 114, a grand total of 180,000 conversations happened on Slack. And if the number sounds somewhat big, keep in mind that it's actually summarized. So it holds threads in it, it holds uh, messages that were posted near each other on a given day. So I think we could even multiply that by three and it, we wouldn't be far off the actual number of messages that were posted on Slack. Um, I was very curious to see what uh, people talked about in Slack conversations. Um, the first thing that I noticed is that 6,000 plus of the messages 
on there linked to, uh, to GitHub slash Kubernetes, to some sort of GitHub entity, an issue, a PR, a comment, which showed to me that a lot of GitHub-related conversation actually happens or continues on Slack. Um, 6,000 6, uh, and three, 329, to be exact, messages included one of my all-time favorite questions, both to ask and to be asked, which is, what do you think? Um, 16,000 messages had my, again, all-time favorite assertion to make and to hear, which is, I don't know. Uh, there were 28,000 occurrences of, I like it, or I agree, um, agreeing with somebody, but then exactly 56 results of, I disagree, which I thought was perhaps way too low. Uh, 319 shout-outs during the 114 uh, timeline and 129 bike shed alerts or invitations, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so compared to Slack and GitHub, a lot less but still pretty significant uh, communications happen through email. Uh, during the 114 timelines, there was a total of 300 emails or thereabouts that were sent in SIG mailing lists, special interest group mailing lists. The conversation length, uh, as we measure that by the email chain length, varies from anywhere between just the one email to, to broadcast and announce something, maybe I should show the actual slide, uh, to, to quite lengthy conversations with around 50, 50 to 60 emails, uh, but averaging at around three to four messages. So it's a lot, I guess, engagement perhaps is a lot less, of course, compared to GitHub or, um, or Slack. Viewership, I haven't run the exact numbers on uh, how many people open and read those emails. Uh, I've seen in the past that typically it's around the 20 to 30 mark, but of course it really depends on the specific topic, on the specific SIG, so it's very common to see um, a big announcement for a SIG or a project to actually reach hundreds of people. And I actually wanted to run the same thing as I did before for the, uh, for the PR titles, but this time for the email titles, because I was quite curious to see, do folks talk about similar or different things in emails? And as you can see, there's a whole lot of things around design, like Kubernetes enhancement proposals, other types of proposals, approving things, and then of course talking a lot about meetings um, and invitations to edit files. But of course, nothing beats good old in-person or more accurately real-time communication. Um, so moving on to real time, a total of 140 SIG working group committee and other public meetings happened during the course of 114, or at least those were the ones that I could find somewhere on the interwebs. And they amount to a combined almost 100 hours of um, synchronous communication. Viewership for the recordings ranges between zero and around 300. Again, it depends on the, on the meeting and the content and the agenda and the, and the SIG and how many uh, members it has. Last but not least, uh, something that I feel is not um, as visible sometimes is that it wasn't only humans that did the work. Machines were also very busy during the uh, 114 release outside, alongside their human friends. Um, as I mentioned before, a pretty significant amount of messages in GitHub conversations, for example, come from bots that help manage issues, issue and PR life cycles. Uh, bots take on everything from uh, reminding folks to sign their CLAs, this will eventually vote. <laughs> uh, it was a screenshot of KCI bot reminding a user to sign their CLA. Rerunning known flaky tests, uh, Basta, if I'm pronouncing his surname correctly, a bot is um, a bot that does many things, but one of them is it holds, as far as I know, context as to which, um, which test jobs are known to be quite flaky and rerun them for folks so that they don't get stuck on, uh, on their PRs. And finally, even posting ponies, which I'm quite sad that it's not going to load because it was quite a lovely picture. Oh, well. You can do a uh, slash pony on any conversation on the Kubernetes GitHub and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, outside GitHub computers also did the heavy lifting of patiently building and testing code and merging contributions. I counted a total of 1,125 different jobs, uh, test jobs that run at some point 
uh, of the life of code that you've contributed to Kubernetes. So that's like either pre-submit before your code has been merged or post-submit or periodically. Um, and of course they produce a whole lot of artifacts, logs and test summaries at the end. So the numbers here are a little bit different, partly because they were so large that it was hard to, uh, to measure over the entire release. I've done it for a two week time span, but also the results don't go as far back. So they refer to the last two weeks from today. But I think they're comparable as these two weeks are not particularly eventful. Uh, right, so over, uh, over two weeks, there are 161,000 and a bit of test runs, which amount to 123,000 and a bit hours of building testing, uh, testing code. Um, keep in mind that a typical release runs for about 12 to 15 weeks, if I'm not mistaken, so you can multiply that by six, six to seven times for the course of a whole release. Um, of these, about 40%, which uh, amounts to around, I guess, like 35 to 36,000 hours a week were failed runs. So that's the CI either picking up on a bug or picking up on a test that's no longer valid or um, encounter, encountering a, an infrastructure flake. Um, I found it quite interesting to compare with the, with the total amount of time that PRs have spent in flight for 1.14, which is around like a million and a bit. And I, uh, it was quite interesting to see that they're actually pretty comparable numbers. That is, that the time that computers have spent building the code with the time that humans have spent uh, putting it together. Okay, so now I would like to go back and answer my original question, which was how is it that this set of people that maybe don't personally know each other, they maybe haven't sat, sat next to each other ever, are in different countries, how do they get together and ship um, software every three months? I think first with a good balance and mix of people that have been around and hold, have been around for a long time and hold a lot of context, and people that are newer to this journey and bring new insight. Secondly, with lots and lots and lots of conversation, uh, iteration, different views coming in the game, asking questions, uh, offering different viewpoints. And last but not least, with a whole lot of help from their robot friends. Thank you very much for coming, and let me know if you have any questions or thoughts or ideas. Uh, you mentioned there are, uh, you found quite a bit of videos, the rec recordings of the meetings, uh, but you also mentioned that there is like no one single place to fi find them, right? Like you had to actually search for them around the internet. Um, what were the places, like where can we see those videos? Uh, yep, so the, the question was that there were quite a, pretty much every community meeting is recorded, but uh, I said that it was a bit challenging because it, well, there wasn't an archive of everything. Uh, so it's, it's interesting because literally every video is recorded and everything is on YouTube. What I struggled with is that, as far as I know, there isn't a list of all the videos ever recorded in one place, and they're not, they weren't named in a way, there, there isn't like a conventional way of naming it so that I could build up a search query. Um, what that meant in practice is I was like, well, I think that most of them will have Kubernetes or Kate in the name, they'll have meeting in the name, they'll have SIG or working group or WG in the name. So, so I stitched all these results together and hopefully I think I got most of them. Um, but that's what it looked like. I was going to ask, how reproducible is this in the future? If we wanted to learn what you know the 115 release, 116 release mm. looked like compared to 114, is there a way to do that, or is it going to be a lot of manual going back and going through all these things? Most of it is pretty reproducible, I would say. Uh, there is a set of pretty nasty Python scripts that <laughs> produce a lot of these numbers. Um, so I would say, yeah, pretty reproducible, with the exception maybe of uh, YouTube recordings, which were the ones that I had to fetch the data manually, to be honest. I think everything else could be reproducible. That's a good point, actually. I would like to perhaps tidy up a bit and include it in the slide deck.
going once, going tight. No one else? Two, three. Thank you. Thank you.